Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You may, you may be seated. Hallelujah. Praise God. Oh, the families here this morning. So great to see all of you. Now, just to start, I want to just mention that two things that I want to mention. First of all, if you see me holding the mic like this, I haven't changed. <laughs> I've been bit by a, what you, not a mosquito, but a, what you, a spider. I got a spider, but I was sleeping, right, last night, and I woke up and I said, wow, man, I can't even move my hand. But then Julie looked at it, she says, it was a spider bite. So I kind of, it's hard to close it, so I'm, But I haven't changed. I'm okay. Like that. I, haven't, I haven't changed, man. You know. And then another thing that I just want to bring out this morning as well is that I don't know. I feel claustrophobia with this wall. <laughs> now you got to be careful when I, when I say that. You know. I was up in, in Whittier, you know, Whittier, and uh, I got up, and I was going to preach that day, and, and then I said, you know what, I feel close to fo Whittier, they have the wall, they had a wall right there, and I said, you know, they're real proud of their church, and I said, you know, I feel like I'm in a box, <laughs> that wall is bothering me, and you know what they did that night, they had a meeting, leadership had a meeting, and I think the next day they had a sledgehammer, And they were knocking that wall down. Yeah. Amen. I did that also in, in Mexico as well. I, I said, man, I, what are we up here for? We're on the second floor. It's hard to get up here, man. I had to walk all the way up to the second floor. And you don't have an elevator. And I said, you got to bring it down. The pastor right away met with his leadership. And he brought the auditorium down. And uh, the church has been growing, you know, so... I don't know how long that's going to be there. I don't know if you could knock it down, but <laughs> it's bothering me. <laughs> you watch and see, man, what effect that's going to have. It's going to have an effect that's going to take place. I know some of the, the church members say, oh, my God, please, Pastor, don't say that. Because they know they're going to have to do the work. <laughs> that, that's why. But I'm so glad to be able to be here this morning. I've been able to also, while the women and everybody were having a time together, ministering. And uh, I was up there in the office, and man, you've, you've taken this church to another level. Taken the church to another level. Just being in the office alone, it was a blessing just to get together with some of the guys in the office and be able to sit there. You could feel a tremendous atmosphere. You could sit down, just relax. And I mean, you talk about quality. Quality, quality man. This, this church is quality. <laughs> quality. And I would just like commend you and congratulate all of you that have actually made it possible. Now, Julie and I feel like we're home. We feel like we're home. We thank God that we were able to be here and be able to be here for six years. I mean, you guys were impossible. <laughs> I thought, you know, when we went ahead and took the church over, I thought that, man, we'd get that together in no time. You know, we're, we're experienced and we're experts. And in one year, we'll get the church rolling where it's supposed to be. And then I'll be able to turn it over to somebody else. Well, one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, six years. Oh, my God. <laughs> but finally, you know, we turned it over to Pastor. And you know what I did purposely? Pastor had been with us, and he was here part of the ministerial staff. As soon as I turned it over to him, 
You didn't see me no more. The next day, I packed up and I was gone. I said, well, they're ready. They're ready to take it over. They're going to make it happen. And praise God, you guys have made it happen. And you're taking it. You have taken it to the next level. Amen? That's the way it's supposed to be. We're not supposed to turn a church over to somebody and all of a sudden begins to collapse. And, but it's supposed to continue forward, not only continue forward, but also continue to grow. And I see this happening here in San Diego. I think those, I'm just going, I'm just you know, talking to you guys for now. I'll get into it. But I, I think uh, in the run for hope, The reason why I have Run for Hope in my mind is that yesterday we were in a, a Run for Hope uh, session, right? What is it? Luncheon, Run for Hope luncheon that we had in, in Whittier. And it just brought back the, I said, well, I think uh, we were the ones in, in San Jose. It wasn't the mother church. We're the ones in San Jose that came in first. And then the mother church came in second. And guess who came in third? <laughs> San Diego came in third. I wonder what's going to happen this year. I think this, this year everybody's getting riled up. I mean, this, all the churches are getting riled up. And... Uh, Pastor Sonny is saying, I'm not going to be second no more. I'm going to be first. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Maybe San Diego will come in first. Whoa, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Well, enough of that, enough of that, amen. I, I want to speak to you some things that are on my heart this morning that I would like to share with you. And what I would like to speak on this morning is uh, speaking on the type of leaders that we need to be able to take this ministry to the next level. The kind of leaders we need to take this ministry to the next level. And I really believe with all my heart that God wants to take us to the next level. But the only way that will happen is that ministers will, ministry will rise up and ministers and leadership will rise up to be able to take it to the level that God wants to take it to. I have uh, two scriptures that I would like to bring out this morning. The first one is in 2 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9. And it's a very familiar scripture. And it says, For the eyes of the Lord reign, reign throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And then we have another one in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. You know this one. This is one of my favorite scriptures. It says, now unto him who was able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord Jesus, this morning we thank you for the great family that you have raised up and that we're able to gather together. I pray, O oh God, that you open the hearts of your people, open up their minds, and also I pray that you speak to me and, and also tell me and share with me and, and move through me in what you want to say to your people. And we give you all the praise and give you all the glory, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. Praise the Lord. What kind of leaders we need that will take this ministry to the next level. Now, the first one that I would say would be leaders that will de de desire to discover God's purpose and God's will for their lives. I think this is very, very, very important because God always begins with a vision. Now, the vision that he's given to us in the very beginning was the treasures out of darkness. That's a scripture that he gave us. That's a scripture that he gave for this ministry. And you can see that this scripture has been fulfilled. It's been fulfilled. God has given us treasures out of darkness, not only locally, but he's given us treasures out of darkness all over 
the world because God has been faithful to his promise. And then also there's another scripture that we find in, in Isaiah 54, verse 2 and 3. And he also says in that scripture, God says that our descendants, our descendants will inherit the nation. That means all of you that are here this morning, all of you that are gathered here this morning, you are the descendants that God is raising up and the promise is, and he says to us, the promise and the mandate is that you will inherit the nations. Wow, that's a big job. So God has given to us a personal vision and a calling for the fulfillment of the overall vision. In other words, he's given to us a sense of mission. That's what this ministry is all about. He's given to us a vision. He's given to us a sense of mission. And when I think about that, I'm thinking about every one of you, the calling, God's purpose, God's vision for you individually. And whatever individual vision that he's given to you is connected. It's connected to the big vision that we have. That's why it's important for you to discover what God wants to do within your life. If he has brought you to Victory Outreach, it's because you are part of the big, big plan that he has for us. That's the purpose. That's the plan that God has for you. He's raised you up. It doesn't matter how insignificant you may feel. It doesn't matter your background, where you come from. But if he's brought you here, it's because you're part of the great mandate and the great vision that he's given to us. I was sharing in the office while we were sitting there, we were talking, and I was saying, you know, in, in the eyes of God, you know, there's no, it's not that a big church is better than a small church. And I was, you know, because many times I'm always uh, trying to provoke. You see me even in my messages, I'm trying to provoke all of you for growth. I'm trying to provoke that you will be able to grow in your capacity and, and grow so that your church will get bigger and that you'll be more effective within your city. And there are churches that go to the city and sometimes I, I kind of provoke them and I challenge them. And the reason why I do that is not because a big church is better than a small church in the eyes of God. As long as you're faithful in your mandate and you're faithful in the calling that God has given to you. But when it comes to victory outreach... When you see other denominations, well, they don't have the same calling that we have. In other denominations, it's all right. You could go into a city and you could have your church, and as long as you take care of them and meet the need of a flock and counsel with them and be there pastorally for that particular ministry, that particular church, it's okay for them. You're doing the job, it is great. You're following God's vision. You're following the vision of the organization. But with us, it's very different because we are a ministry that is mission-driven. That's what we are. God raised us up from the very beginning. He's given us a mandate. He's given us a mission. And we are a, a vision or a mandate-driven ministry. This is why we kind of provoke. This is why we challenge. It's because we're not just a ministry to just have a church and be there comfortable, but we're a ministry that God has given to us and a calling that God has given to us to take the world for Jesus. That's why whenever I preach, it's all inside of me, man. Whenever I preach and whenever I minister, it comes out. Naturally, it comes out. The very purpose, the very vision that God has given to us from the beginning. Now, this is something that doesn't happen right away. Sometimes you're kind of looking around to see what God has for you in victory outreach. And you're trying to find your place and you're involved in different ministries in victory outreach. Trying to find your place of the contribution that you make for the ministry. So, it's important then to be able to find what God has for you. And I understand that. 
when I think about, you know, trying to find your place, it happened to me in the very beginning. It wasn't just all of a sudden that overnight God says, okay, open up Victory Outreach, and you open up Victory Outreach. No, no, I was trying to find my place. And I got myself involved in different ministries. I was first an evangelist, and then uh, I was there for a while, and I was doing evangelistic work, and I was an evangelist. And all I knew was my, my spiritual parents were all evangelists. So naturally I said, well, if they're evangelists and God used them to reach me, then my calling is as an evangelist. And I didn't do too bad. I stretched a few legs. You know, you, sometimes you get real excited. You know, I, I was watching one time, I was, I was watching... You know, the way these evangelists operate, man, they operate heavy, you know, and there's he healing evangelists. Then I said, well, I got the same anointing they have. <laughs> so I remember that we had an altar call, and uh, the altar, then there was a brother that came up, and the Philip Cruz wife, Cindy, she was praying for him, and I was excited. You know, some preachers get excited. You know, I got excited. And I said, I feel like healing here today. I feel healing here today. My God, I feel miracles here today. And then I said, Cindy, this brother has a leg problem. Because he got him up like this, you know, his leg problem, you know. I said, Cindy, get a hold of that leg. <laughs> he kind of had a crutch, too. I said, get that crutch out of the way. Get a hold of that leg. God is going to heal him. And then she got up. She went down, you know, real obedient. She went down. <laughs> got his leg, you know. And I said, well, come on, Cindy. Go for it. <laughs> and she going like that. I said, what's the matter with this? Where's your faith? <laughs> you know what it was? He had a wooden leg. <laughs> After the service, she came up to me, said, Pastor, she was crying, don't you ever do that to me again. It's heavy when you're trying to find your place. <laughs> Until I came to understand that really God had called me to be a pastor. See, whatever God's vision and purpose is for you, God will always give you the giftings to be able to accomplish it. That's why you shouldn't try to do something you're not supposed to do. There's some guys that want to be preachers. They want to preach, and they keep on bugging the pastor. Pastor, when are you going to put me up there to preach? And the pastor says, the last time you preached, everybody fell asleep. <laughs> because that wasn't his calling. But some of you look at the people, and you say, I see Pastor Rick. Wow, he's so powerful. <laughs> that if Pastor Rick could do it, then bless God, I could do it as well. Well, it doesn't work that way. God raised up Pastor Rick. God has anointed Pastor Rick. He's anointed Pastor Al. Ooh. And he has a special anointing for you as well. We need to get ourselves and align ourselves to our power spot. And you're very much needed. You are unique. Your ministry is unique. Your calling is unique. Your anointing is unique. Your power spot is unique. And you're very much needed within the, vic within the ministry of Victory Outreach. See, nothing happens until you discover God's vision and God's purpose for your life. The reason why we've been able to have success 
around the world is because I aligned myself. I came to understand the calling that I had, and I aligned myself to the calling of God and the power spot and the anointing that God had for me. Now, if somebody tries to copy it, and then I call for it, it's not going to happen. Not going to happen. So you need to align yourself with the calling and the vision that God has for you, the anointing that God has for you. And lately, I want to tell you, God has taken us to another dimension. There are some tremendous things that are happening in Victory Outreach. I've been, uh, you know, I get the calls. I get the calls from different people all over the world, and they give me a list of the different people that they need in their ministry. I just got a call from Australia, my God, and he had a big list. <laughs> he said, Pastor, what I need, I just want to tell you what I need, man. I need it real bad. I need a pastor for the youth. I need a pastor for the music. I need a pastor for the homes. And he went on and on with the whole list of the different leadership that he needed. Now, where do I, where do I find these people? Where am I going to find these people? And then not only that, then Pastor Chucky, you know, we, we also in, in Africa, we've done, we've united two churches that were there in Joburg. We united, united, united them, we're uniting them together. In fact, uh, uh, what's his, Danny is here. Where is he at, Danny? Danny's here. He's we aligned his church, his church, also with the Joburg church, and put them together. Yeah. Put them together. And then Pastor Chucky starts telling me, you know, uh, Pastor Sonny, and, and now that we have a team, we're going to need this. We're going to need this type of leadership. We need that type of leadership and that type of leadership. And, and he says, I don't have them here in South Africa. So you need to look around and get that type of leadership. So I went to Pastor Danny. I said, Pastor Danny, well, how long are you going to be here in America? He says, well, I'm going to be here for maybe another month or so. I says, okay, then go ahead and find those leaders. <laughs> Need leaders for, for that. And then also what about Panama? Panama. I, I, I launched out. And I launched out there in Panama, and the very first time that I got involved in a Spanish-speaking ministry, and I launched out because it was a need, so I launched out to that need. And we need leaders, and I was looking, we need leaders. We need this kind of leader, this other kind of, this other kind of leader. We need leaders for the ministry. And I could go on and on with the different ministries around the world, the different ministries that need leaders. That's why I scripture pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he will raise up leadership. And I believe that the leadership that we need, all the leadership that we need are in victory outreach. The only thing is, is that you haven't been spotted. That's why I'm, you even hear this. Pastors are getting afraid of me now. <laughs> you haven't been recognized. You, you haven't been spotted. You're there and somehow hidden. But God wants to reveal you. And he wants to. Re See, when, when God wants to do a work and it's God's will to do a work, he'll have people that will pre be prepared to be able to do that work. He'll anoint the lives of people. He, he will place callings on people's lives. This is why I'm saying to you this morning that uh, God's, God's calling upon you and the calling that you have, it goes along with the overall calling that God has for victory outreach. And just got into something new that we're involved in. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pioneer. I've always been a pioneer. In the very beginning, I, you know, I, I had the, uh, I have, I had the uh, advantage of getting saved in a ministry that 
wasn't even established yet. In the early days of the ministry, that was Teen Challenge. That's where I got to New York City. In fact, there's an album that says the Challengers. And Dave is talking about God is t reaching drug addicts and gang members. And, uh, and he goes on and speaks on that album. But there's a choir, and I'm there singing in the choir. <laughs> and everybody in the choir squares. And I'm the only dolphin. And I'm looking, where are those drug addicts? You know, where, <laughs> where are those gang members? Because I was the only one. It was Nikki, the ex-gang leader from the Mau Mau gang, and myself, the first drug addict that came in and got saved in Team Challenge. And then I was under a leadership, leadership. I wasn't under a dead leader. I was under a leader that reminds me of myself, a leader that had a passion. Leader that had a passion. David Wilkerson had a passion of reaching the drug addicts and the gang members and the inner city of New York. That's the passion that he had to reach New York for Jesus. Well, I heard his sermons. You know, I'd be sitting there in the chapel and I hear, God, thank God, God. You know, he had a passion. And then Nikki got stirred up and says, come on, man. Come on, we got to reach the gang members. Now, I didn't feel for those gang members. <laughs> At that particular time, I, I had a passion for my own people. But he had a passion for the gang. Okay, so we go to the gang members. And then we're trying to give him the gospel. Nikki's trying to give him the gospel. You know, I didn't really even have an idea. He's trying to get, and those guys are making jokes, and those guys are jumping around, and those guys weren't even listening. He tries to make an old. Nobody comes. I said, Nikki, these people don't need God. I know of people that need God. Let's go to the drug addicts. See, it was God's time for the drug addicts in New York City. God was about to do something. He had raised up his man, David Wilkerson, Somehow he put me in the scene. He put Nikki in the scene together. He made us a team, and then we went out. And again, pioneering. Going out, what do I know about preaching? I don't know. Nikki knew more about preaching because he had, he had been in Bible school for three years. He had just come to New York. And I went ahead, and I don't know, but I, I said, this man has a vision, man. This man, David Wilkerson, has a vision. And God saved me. And if the Lord, look at that. If the Lord, I didn't have fully understand. But if the Lord saved me, and he saved me here, then I am part of this great vision that God has for us. So I, I went out, you know, Nick, I went out to the neighborhood, you know, where I come from. And what do I know about preaching? I, hey, man. He said, go ahead. He gave me the mic. Hey, man, that's me, Sonny. Here I am. I used to burn you before. I used to break into your apartments. But I want you to know that Jesus came and Jesus changed my life. Then I'm telling Then I ran out of what to tell him. Here's Nikki. And Nikki would come up and made, he was more, you know, he made an altar call. And to my amazement, all these guys that I knew came up to the altar crying. And I said, wow, this works. <laughs> this really, so it was a pioneer days. I was pioneering like that, okay? Uh, coming to Los Angeles, this before Victory Outreach. Again, it was pioneering time. Dave Wilkerson said, we need a teen challenge in Los Angeles. All of a sudden, I found myself supervisor of the teen challenge in Los Angeles. And again, okay, well, we believe in God. If the anointing of God is in New York, then the anointing of God is going to be in Los Angeles as well. Okay, and all of a sudden, we started reaching people. In fact, 
Dell was over there, one of the guys. Pastor Dell. We started reaching, and they started coming in. Even Andre Crouch, you know, the singer Andre Crouch, he became our choir director. It was a co-ed situation that we were having. We had their co-ed. And God began to move. We filled up that whole center. And then after that, guess what? And then I said, okay, now I want you to pioneer something else. And then he got me into pioneering victory outreach. <laughs> Gave me a vision for victory to reach out to other young men and women that were lost and needed a church. And we established the very first drug addict gang member church. Again, pioneering. And because of the anointing of God, it's not something that everybody could do, but because of the anointing of God, we had a breakthrough. We had revival. I took some of you, I remember that you were there in the early days. We had revival that actually broke out. So I've always been, man. I've always been. You know, I, I've always been a pioneer. Always been a pioneer. There's always new things that are taking place in our ministry because we are a pioneer ministry. You know what type of ministry we are? We are a ministry, actually, a frontier, cutting-edge ministry that God has called us to be trailblazers. This is who we are. We are a frontier, cutting-edge ministry that God has called us to be blessed trailblazers. Now, let me tell you something else. And I still haven't even got some, I got the first point. That's where I'm, I'm at right now. Well, I'll keep you all day. That's all right. Recently, I really have had a burden. And uh, sometimes the Lord wakes me up like that and I'm all stressed and just the burden that God gives me. And I couldn't sleep. And then one of the things that I had, I had a, a concern about some of the churches that go out to these different places. First, I had a concern about the problem of drug addiction, the epidemic that has taken place around our country, places like New Hampshire, places like West Virginia, places like Ohio, different places around our country that there's an epidemic of drug addiction, and we are not there. There was a burden that I, and then I said, well, the way that we do it, usually we send a church. And we've done that before. We send churches into a state, into a place, into a city, and they go there. They only have 50 people, and five years later, they still have 50 people. They're not taking that city for Jesus. And I said, well, we can't do it that way. We sent a church to West Virginia. It may be a church that has 50 people and maybe not even reach the city. Or we send a church over to Ohio and maybe they'll do the same. Or a church uh, to uh, New Hampshire and they'll do the same. And suddenly the Lord put in my heart, remember the old ways you used to do it? He says, go back to old school. Old school. And the way we used to do it before was we would put a home first. Put the home first. And then the home would have a, a breakthrough. And after the breakthrough, then after that, then we would put a pastor. But we would have the breakthrough first. Now, we're all set up for that. Organizationally, we're all set up. You know, we have... Two different organizations. When you have, uh, we have the the Victory Home International. That's that's a that's an organization on its own. And we changed that. We did that. Victory Home International. They have their own corporation, their own board of directors, their own organization. And then we have Victory Outreach International, right? Victory Outreach International. So I was thinking, man, we're all set up. To go with the homes, Victory Home International, 
and begin to invade those cities. So guess what we're doing? We have spies, just like in the Bible, that have gone out to those In fact, they're there now. The first place that they went was into New Hampshire. And guess what happened? They went there with the, where the drug addicts were. They began to, to speak to the drug addicts, and the drug addicts began to respond. They began to pray for them. And then there were a few that were after them, and they said, man, we want to get out of here. We are hooked, man. They're all hooked on heroin. We want to get out of here. They spoke to the mayor, and the mayor said, we need your ministry here. Guess what? That drug addict, they want to get out of there. They, they put him on a bus. And they, he's on his way over here to Victory Outreach Chino. We're going to put him in that home, Victory Outreach Chino. You know what they had to do to him? The fire department, because this potent what they're using. The fire department said, the guy from the fire department says, you know what? You can't put him on a bus, and then he's going to get sick. So they give him a drug that will last for three days. That means for three days, he'll be able to come and be kicking, not feel it, and then come and come over here. And this is something that we would think of bringing those guys, getting them out of there, bringing them to California. And already we have that in New Hampshire. It's opening wide. Barry was there, and Manuel was there, and Another one, there's a group that's there, and they've been speaking to them. In fact, they even have a, a man that owns a construction company, a big construction company. He says, when you come over here, I want you to know we're behind you. We have a need here in our city. Now, I think they're in West Virginia. West Virginia. And we got to hear what's going to happen in West Virginia. Then from there, they're going into Ohio. we got to hear what's happening in Ohio. So we're believing that by the beginning of next year, we're going to be putting three homes, one in West Virginia, one in Ohio, and another one in New Hampshire. Now, that takes me to, if we're going to operate like that, then what kind of leadership do we need? Well, what kind of leadership? Now, first of all, over there, they're all white folk. I could just see a, a Chicano going, you know, man, you know. <laughs> now, he'll get away with it with our drug addicts because the heroin addicts are heroin addicts, right? You know, you could relate with the heroin addicts. I mean, all you got to do is show them your marks, man. I was a dope fiend, too. And you're able to communicate and connect with them. But there's a difference with what we're trying to do. We want to not only reach the drug addicts, but we also want to reach their families. And all those families are real white and sophisticated. So what am I saying? A guy doesn't even know how to speak English and talk to the families? Naturally, you got to get the right profile for the people that we're sending. And not only that, but even the director it's going to have to know a little bit about administration. It's going to have to know a little bit about pastoral, how to be able to also work with the drug addicts and have a staff under him that's going to be working with the drug addicts. who's also going to make it co-ed. It's going to be men and women within the home. So what do we need? Well, we need someone as a director that is able to also fit the role of pastoral. Well, because we're not going to have another church, go to another church. On Sunday morning, we'll be having church there and inviting the families. Yeah. Probably Thursday night, we're going to be having open house. We're going to try to also, also raise up a, a choir. Yeah. I mean, we got all kinds of vision that we have, something totally different of the way we're operating now. I'm going back to those Teen Challenge days when the Andre Crouch was the choir director. We had a choir. I, I have an album also. I was part of the choir in New York. I don't think they put me there because I could sing. They needed a dolphin. 
They, could, they didn't put Nikki. Nikki couldn't speak English at that time. <laughs> so they put me, and they put me in the middle. <laughs> all those Bible school students, they look real sophisticated. All the guys look sophisticated. And I, So what are we doing? We're going ahead and we're, we want some people. We, we, we need leadership and we need people, preferably a white folk. <laughs> or someone that could communicate with the families. So when they come, I think the staff, we could have a combination of black, white, brown. <laughs> so this is an opportunity now. This is an opportunity You'd be surprised how many of the white folk, the reason why I say that is because most of our ministry, look at it, man. You, I, I just read the names and Gonzalez and uh, Rodriguez. <laughs> That's what we have in, our, in Victory Outreach. So we're looking around and I'm looking and I, like I see that white guy right there, you know. <laughs> There's another white guy over here, too, man. I'm a spotter. Looking around, my God. See how God works? This is a time where God is raising up maybe some of you that haven't even been discovered. And I'm not talking only about the white guys, you know, and white girls, you know. Or should I say proper Anglos? Or... <laughs> but I'm talking about some of you that have been undercover. That now is when God is taking it off of your brother and sister, and He's saying, It is now your time. And you know what's been happening everywhere? Like I, I was over in, in, in uh, where was that again? Over in Reno. Somehow we, I'm, I don't know why, I don't, I'm just keeping on like that. And it's all right. I was in Reno. And then we're having, you know, how whenever I go, you get people coming around me. And like in the office there, they wore me out. <laughs> I had to preach to them in the office. And I says, enough is enough, man. I got to go and you, you leave me. I got to still have preaching over here in general session. Well, in Reno, we got around together like that. And when something's in my heart, it just comes out. And there was a, a white guy. <laughs> All these white people here are getting complexes here. This, this. <laughs> there was a white guy that was sitting there. You know, one of the white brother. What's his name? Davey. Some of you. Baby, baby's not here, right? I don't know. I don't know why they call him Davey, you know. They could have said it more sophisticated, David, you know. But he was sitting there, and uh, you have, over there you have Indians, you got all kinds of different people, you know, so I'm sharing with them. And then when I'm speaking about, you know, we, we have a need, and, you know, we, we're believing God to raise up leadership, you know, and I, you know, like, you know, and we've got to raise up, and I keep on, my finger just automatically kept on pointing at him. <laughs> and they just send them out to be a pastor. <laughs> and somehow, you know, I'm speaking, and you know, and you know, and, and we need, you know, and you know, and you know, and, and I, I wasn't doing it purposely. Wasn't doing it purposely. Then at the end of the session, he comes to me, says, Pastor, I was just sent out, but I feel possibly that God is speaking to me, and I want you to know that I am ready to go. Yeah. And then Pepe says, You know what? I'm ready to send him. Don't worry, I got somebody else. We just send him out. I got somebody else to take the church, and I'm ready to send him. Yeah. And he's going to be one of the guys that we're going to be interviewing. It's going to be in July 10th, I believe it is. July 10th, we have those candidates. We have people from our different ministries. This is different because it's not just one church putting a home. 
We're putting our home, we're putting homes, and we're getting leadership from different churches that would fill the fit the profile that we're looking for within that state and within that city. And it's beginning to happen. There's a stirring. This is the time for Victory Home International. I think I have one of the board members that's here right now, right? And he's going, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's happening. It's happening. And guess what? And I'm going to get Guess what? Also, what we have is also that in August, I don't know if we have the date yet in August, but in August, I believe it is, we are going to be having November, rather, November. In November, we're going to be having our very first Victory Home International Conference. We don't know even where to have it. We can't even have it at the mother church. That place is going to be totally packed out. So we're trying to find a place to be able to have it. And in that conference is where we're going to be launching out. Launching out these teams. And we're going to go out there by faith and begin to take those cities and those states for Jesus Christ. So that means those of you that maybe you're not able to be a pastor, or some of you maybe you haven't been spotted, or maybe they've overlooked you, but you have an anointing, you have an anointing in this particular type of ministry that I'm talking about and that we're talking about. I want you to know that this is your time. This is your time. And I, the vision, I'm going to get into this because I just keep on. The vision from God, when I'm talk, what I'm talking about right now, the vision from God will always require faith. That's why I always speak about faith. I think there was a video that was saying, faith, faith, faith. Remember that? Faith, faith, faith. And he didn't come on in a, in a shirt. Faith, 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 faith. faith. And the reason why is because whatever you're going to do, what we're talking about right now is going to require faith. If it's a vision, if it's from God, it's going to be too big for you to do on your own. Anything that God calls you to do is something that is going to be, you can't do it on your own. You need God. God always starts with a vision and a mission that is bigger than self. I was sitting here. And I'm sitting with, what's your name again? Pastor Rick. I'm kidding. <laughs> you look like Pastor Rick, you know. I'm sitting with Pastor Rick. And then Pastor Al begins to give me an introduction. And I think so. And we have with us Pastor Sonny. And he is the pastor of the world. And <laughs> he's an apostle. I was sitting there with Rick, and I'm feeling smaller and smaller. And I said to Pastor Rick, I turned around and says, man, I'm going to have to get out there and ask God for fire to come down from heaven. <laughs> Hallelujah. And it's true. It's not man that's able to do it. Is always God the one that does it. Because whatever God has called you to do, and this is going to take faith. And it's going to take faith because it's going to take faith because you've got to step out. And it's very difficult to step out. And God does the searching within your heart. And then you say, oh, God, when you look at yourself, you feel so very insignificant. But this is where God is saying, don't worry about it. Anything that I'm going to give you is always going to be bigger than self. But he says, God, I am the one that's going to do it. That's why I'm excited about what's happening there. So vision. I mentioned about vision, right? 
vision is so very important for all of us. And the vision is not isolated. Again, this is what I want to drive into you. Your vision is not isolated from the overall vision that we have in victory. The overall mandate that we have in victory outreach. See, if God is going to do something, you are the one that's going to make it complete. And if you don't give yourself There'll be a void there. So God is saying, man, didn't I call you? Didn't I raise you up? Didn't I save you? And you're in victory hours. It's about time you step up and make yourself known. Oh, my God. I feel God working in people right now. Secondly, and I'm trying to go, I'm going to try to go a little faster. Secondly, the type of people that we need, type of leaders that we need to take this thing to another level. That's what I like about this church. Pastor Al, Georgina, took it to another level. I get excited when I do that, when I see that. We got the type of people are leaders that have the desire to grow. You must have the desire to grow. The reason why ministries stop growing is because the leader stops growing. Growing ministries always require growing leaders. See, when a leader stops growing, he becomes inflexible. That's what happens to many people. They always want to do the same thing over and over. They become inflexible, and they say, we've always done it this way. I've seen this happen. When I came here, and I took over this church, there were people like that. We've always done it this way. There was a Ugly, what was it in the lobby over there? A fountain, ugly fountain. <laughs> and it looked like it was sacred to the people here in San Diego. I said, let's knock down that ugly fountain. <laughs> oh, pastor. We've always had it for such a long time. Thank God we knocked it down. But <laughs> I go to San Jose. It's the same thing. San Jose, the same thing. I mean, they were stuck. Well, we've, we've had this for 30 years. I said, knock it down. <laughs> when still, they want to still lead the old way. And God is saying, I have something new. Throughout the years, I have made many changes within my ministry. I'm flexible. And some of the leadership and even the elders say, where's he going to go now? Where is he taking us now? And I said, come on with me, man. Let's all jump together in there. God is with us. Because I understand that the, the attitude and the skill that brought you to the point that you're in right now may not be able to take you to the future. New challenges and opportunities require new skills, new skills. What brought you success in the past may not be good for the future. I want you to know that. We're moving. We are a futuristic ministry. The strategies that worked for you in the past may not work for you in the future. You know what I always do? I always uh, try to learn from the young people. They tell me now is the, uh, what do you call it, the phone? What do you call it, online? They say now people don't watch TV. People don't watch TV. He says everything is going to be online. So we got to put everything online. So I went and I broke my TV. <laughs> I'm kidding, but <laughs> I don't want you to break, go break your TVs now, you know. Pastor Sonny told me to break the TV. No. I realized that we're in a whole new level. We're, we're in a whole, a whole time. I'm one of the oldies now. I'm antique. <laughs> Things have changed. And if we want to take this thing to a new level, then we have to listen to the methods and the, the strategies that are going to be effective and that are going to work for us right now. I'm open to that. See, the root behind resistance and change is always fear. And unwillingness to change is always a lack of faith. Fear, 
a lack of faith. When you are resistant to change, that's an indication of the lack of faith. It says I'm really going to hold on to the security of the way I've always done things. See, you should never, listen, never stop developing your skill, your perspective, your heart, your vision, and especially your dependency on God. Your dependency on God. And the moment you think I've learned it all, there is to my ministry, then you're actually finished. You may be dedicated and developing new skills. It won't work. People, and if you're dedicated and you're not developing new skills, it won't work. People tend to rise to the level of the competence and get stuck there. If you don't watch out, your ministry could get too big for you, and you will be the one that will bottleneck. What do we need to get a hold of? We need to get a hold of faith. We need to get a hold of commitment. And also it has to do with your thinking mentality. Small mind, small ministry. What has brought us to this global ministry is that we've let our minds to be developed. Let our minds expand. And also the expansion of our capacity as well. When you don't grow on the inside, it's just a matter of time when everything on the outside is going to get stagnated. I believe, but I believe, here's the part, I believe you are the generation. Like it says, legacy, legacy. I believe you are the generation that's going to take this ministry to another level. Give yourself a hand clap right now. And then thirdly, what kind of leaders do we need that will take us to the next level? Okay, leaders who are focused. Leaders must keep focused with the vision that God has given. There are leaders that start out on the right track, but as time goes back, they lose their sense of vision and also mission as well. They get involved in many things, and they don't do that one thing that you're supposed to do. One of the things that I find myself, if people say, don't this guy change, I find myself focus. Focus. The focus is we're a mission-driven ministry, our calling and our mission and our vision is still to take the world. The generation shall inherit the desolate cities. That's a promise that God has given to us and if we take a hold of that promise and we believe it with all of our heart, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. See, God has anointed you for a particular area of ministry and we need to stay focused in our power spot. When you get distracted from your purpose in life, you become vulnerable and you become like everybody else. You lose your uniqueness. I always want to be unique. I want to blow people's minds. Wow, he's different than anybody else. Wow, his ministry is different from the other ministries. That's when we know that we are on track because of our uniqueness. See, there's a lot of things that could distract you, personal problems, finances, even recreation, business, marriage, family, other interests. But listen to what it says in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Jesus says, seek ye first. I read that over and over again. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousnesses. And all these things will be added unto you. What are these things that are going to be added? All the things that God has promised us. Promised you. But you need to seek him first. And then also, fourthly, we need leaders that are not arrogant and proud. Do you, you know, sometimes you can just sit there and when they speak, you, you could see it, you know. Sometimes they even say, and, and God. <laughs> or they try to be like the other preachers on television. And oh. And they have that air about them. And I'm saying, oh, my God. This is another guy in these construction. You, you could see, see, we have to be careful because we, the way we set up our ministry, we set up our ministry that people are going to be servants, right? Not to be proud and arrogant, 
but servants. And I've said this before. We've seen it over and over again. People begin to admire you in Victory Outreach. If you preach to anybody that I, you know, go preach and I speak about, people say, oh, he, he must be a man of God. And people begin to admire you, and then they compliment you. They open the doors for you, and then even save parking spaces for you. Now, there was a lot of people that were parking, they were turning and parking one of those spaces out there where you got to walk, right, unless they have a bus that brings you. But when I was driving, I said, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm the invited guest. <laughs> so I pulled into the, into the parking space, and sure enough, there were guys there, you know, okay, here he is, Pastor Sonny, now, come on. <laughs> come on, this way, this way, this way. So I come with my car, and I was going to go and even, you know, I didn't want to take a lot of space, so I was going to park in one of those parking spaces. No, 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 no. Come on and park right here. Instead of parking this way, he parked me sideways. I think I took over three parking spaces. <laughs> but we're trained like that to be a servant, servant, and be respectful to those that are over you. This is the way we're trained. But some people that are novices, it affects them. It makes them proud. It makes them arrogant. They think there's somebody special. Listen, none of us are special. We are all servants of God. You with me still? You'll be surprised. And my, my wife knows me real well. You'll be surprised. Every time I have to speak somewhere, I get nervous. I was on television the other day, and Matthew Crouch said to me, are you nervous? You know, I was speaking there and, like, sitting with him and speaking over there. He said, are you nervous? I said, I sure am. Do you still get nervous? I said, I sure do. <laughs> Even sitting here, man, with this big introduction, my God. <laughs> I was sinking deeper and deeper, and I got to make fire come out of heaven, man. If I... Little old me. But isn't it nice that he's taken the foolish things of the world? Isn't it nice? That means if God is able to use me, isn't it nice? Unsophisticated person, simple person. Let me keep putting myself down a little bit more. <laughs> if he is able to use me, I have you know this morning, he's able to use anybody. That means he's able to use you and you and you. And you, if he's able to use me. That's why he's done. I mean, he raised me up so that he could get all the credit and all the glory. So, see, pride has many faces. You got to be careful. Sometimes some look so humble. They play that humble thing on the, outs on the outside. Si, sí, hermano. <laughs> I don't even know why everybody says, do you need anything? I know that if I tell him what I need, I need a burrito, go get it. <laughs> One time a brother said to me, do you need anything? And I said, yes. I want you to go to East L.A. What's the name of that? Alan, Alan, Alan D's. Alan B's. And I want you to get me a burrito right now. Shocked him. Oh. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm only kidding. I'm, I'm, I'm only kidding. So, so you got to be careful when you come around me and say, do you need anything? You better be ready. <laughs> See, they're humble on, and then they're humble on the outside, proud. 
as a peacock in his heart. Amen. And many of you, I'm looking around. I can't sing, right? See, God can't give you a big ministry if you cannot handle it. Humbleness is in the attitude of the heart. And then what is the, what is the answer to pride? What is, what is the answer to pride? I think the answer to pride is the grace of God. The grace of God. Grace means that God knows all your hang-ups. And still, with all your hang-ups that you have, imagine that I would have not chosen you, but he has chosen you. We are trophies of God's grace in spite of our flaws, weaknesses, and also our fears. And even our mixed, mixed uh, motives. Because we all have mixed motives. Why do you want to grow your church? Why do you want to take the world? Are you doing it for self? So you could be big? Or are you doing it for God? Every so often I have to check my motives. And if it's not God, then I have no business doing it. It has to be God. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 says, Not because we think we could do anything lasting, of lasting value by, by ourselves. Our only power, listen, our only power and success comes from God. Job 22 says, God brings down the proud and saves the humble. God has a way, let me tell you something, quiero que sepa esto. I'm, I'm from Panama. Quiero que sepa esto en esta mañana, hallelujah. God has a way of humbling us. Papacito Dios. Tiene una manera de humillarnos. So it's better for you to catch on and get wise before he humbles you. Okay, number five. We need leaders that are going to take this ministry to another level that are not complacent and self-satisfied. And this is the last one that I'm bringing out. Not complacent, and hear that word? Lazy. Complacent, goes together. Complacent and lazy. Whenever you're coasting, I've said this before, whenever you're coasting, how are you going? When you're coasting, you're going downhill. You're not going uphill. Whenever you're coasting, you're going to be going downhill. What is the answer to the problem of complacency? Never stop depending on God. And then also, this is important that I've always done, and I've practiced it over and over again. Never stop depending on God, but be ready. This is what we're talking about this morning or this afternoon. We are ready to take new challenges of faith. If you don't want to become complacent, then take on new challenges of faith. This is what I do. I've taken on new challenges of faith. Every, you see me constantly. Some people say, why don't you retire and take it easy? And I thought I was going to do that when I turned the church over to Sonny. Yeah, okay, take the church. I'm going to relax now. Take it easy. And then you guys came up, man. And just <laughs> disturb my retirement. <laughs> and I found myself here. And then after that, just recently, I took the challenge of uh, Panama. I don't even know Spanish, preaching Spanish. I got to get Luis to interpret for me. Boy, they're real classy Spanish we have in the church. And if I come, I may say some cuss words. In fact, I did. <laughs> you know what I did? I am over there and I'm, I'm preaching, right? So what happens when you're you get excited, right? <laughs> right? You know, you're preaching, and I'm excited. I'm excited. Oh, I'm ex you people excite me. And that's a sexual...
So you know what I said? I said, oh. Like, oh. Cada uno de ustedes me excitita. And the sisters in the front from Panama, I know, Pastor. <laughs> Te emociona. I said, what did I do wrong? <laughs> then I'm also at the, at the, see, I'm talking to families. This is good talking. I'm at the home, you know, the victory home over there in, in Panama. And then the, uh, the director of the Victory Home, he's got connection with the, you know, over there with the, uh, the, the politicians. So one politician elects is the mayor of the, of the city. So the mayor, he's real, he's more real sophisticated. He's very so, mayor of the city. And then he comes out to see me because he knows that I'm in the home. So he sits down with me, and then he tells me he was a dolphin. I used to be a dolphin before, and Jesus saved me, and now... I'm here, and look what God has done within my life. And he's telling me, you know, I used to do this, and I used to do that. And then I say to him, oh, <laughs> tu eras un malito. <laughs> and he thinks I said, una malita. <laughs> and I was, oh, no, pastor, no, oh, no. He thought I, he thought I was telling him that he was gay. <laughs> In other words, oh, you were gay. Oh, no, Pastor, no, 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 no. Eso no. Oh, eso no, Pastor, eso. <laughs> you see how the Spanish could get you in trouble? <laughs> so now I try to play it safe, and I take Luis, Luis with me. Luis, Luis, he's a great interpreter. But all the, these challenges, always stepping out. It's exciting, man. Isn't it dull? Imagine it dull to do nothing and just sit there and do nothing year after year after year doing the very same thing, doing nothing. I mean, after a service like this and after a message like this, something's happening to you. You're, 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 getting, you're getting stirred up. You're taking a look at your own ministry and saying, man, I'm stirred up. Oh, God. God, I need to change. I need to take that step of faith. Woo. Throughout my ministry, I have always taken new challenges of faith. I took it in Holland. I took it here in San Diego. I'm taking it in Panama, that new Spanish-speaking program. Just recently, we took on San Jose and many other ministries that I've taken on. Why? Because it's challenging. I want to grow. I want to develop. I want to do everything that God has for me. And I want you to stay standing. So this morning, what are you going to do? If you're not tempting the impossible, then you don't need God. We always need something that will keep us on our knees. That means we need to step out this morning into miracle territory. And what does Proverbs say? Proverbs 3, 6. And everything that you do, put God first. And he will direct you and crown your efforts with success. So this afternoon, what kind of leaders do we need? In Victory Outreach, I will take this ministry to another level. Number one, leaders who desire to discover God's purpose for their life. Number two, leaders that have a desire to grow. Number three, leaders that are focused. Number four, leaders that are not arrogant and proud. Number five, I believe it is, leaders that are not complacent and self Satisfy. I'll make you say amen to that. I'll make you say amen to that. Okay? Then, uh, what are you going to do? I mean, if there was a challenge, my God, Pastor Rick, if that was them, if I was standing there, man, I'd, I'd be running to this altar. Oh, yeah, even pastors. Look at that pastor. Come on. Come on. Run! Run! Come on to the altar right now. Oh! Yeah, you are yeah, ready and willing. You are yeah, use me today. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, come on. This
this is your day. This is your time. softly like that. You know, this morning has been a, more of an apostolic message for every one of you that are here this morning. It's not just another message. I want you to know that. It's not just another message. This is a message for Victory Outreach. This is a message for you this morning. God speaking to you. And you could either receive it or put it aside or reject it, but this is your moment. It doesn't matter who you are, how significant you may feel, inadequate you may feel. This is your moment. This is your moment. 